Good morning. Please stand with me, take your hymnals, and turn to hymn number 327. We will sing all three stances of He Lives, 327. Good morning. It is good to have you today. Welcome to all of you. Let's pray, and then we'll be seated. Our Father, we thank you that we do indeed have a living God, a living Savior, Christ Jesus our Lord, who is at this very moment seated at your right hand, waiting for the final declaration. And we pray, Lord, that that would come quickly, and that Christ would return and set up his kingdom, and that we would be with him forever. But until that happens, please teach us your word. Please teach us to be faithful. Please grant to us great understanding and appreciation for who you are and your sovereign authority over every aspect of our lives. And we pray then your blessing upon our service to that end today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Please turn back a handful of pages now to 119. We will sing all three stances of Greatest Thy Faithfulness. 119.
please turn back to 239. We will sing all four stances of In Christ Alone.
take your hymnals again and stand with me and turn to hymn 244. We'll sing all three verses of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, hymn 244. Our instrumental number this morning is 388 in the songbook, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And as we get ready, I just want to take a second. Uh, this was the time we normally took the offertory is how this originated. And I want to thank you for your giving and uh, remind us that we give to the Lord uh, through the local church. That is his plan. And so um, perhaps not taking the offering becomes a little more easy to neglect that. I don't think so, but... Just an encouragement along those lines. Thank you.
Hebrews chapter number 7 this morning, please. Hebrews chapter number 7. And let's go ahead and stand, please. Of course, always as we are physically able. And we're going to read verses 1 through 22 this morning. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom Abraham, even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Without contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which the tribe that Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and profitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that sent unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help me today. Let's pray that you'd help me. Father, we are New Testament people and we need to understand in all of its richness and its fullness this core New Testament truth. And so please minister your word to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may, of course, be seated. <clears throat> I want to introduce this morning just by taking us back for a couple of minutes to the very beginning. What we are reading is actually a sermon. Who it is that wrote it, that preached it, is unknown, although I would argue on the basis of 2, 1 through 4, it is not possibly the Apostle Paul. In chapters 2 and 3, he has introduced to us the purpose and the reason for the sermon. And that, there, that is that there is a rest for us to enter. There is a rest for us to enter. And that rest is ultimately, at the end of the day, our very own salvation. Just as God rested on the seventh day of his creation... He rested because he was done. Doesn't mean God never did anything ever again. It means that he was done creating. 
If God had rested on the fifth day, the creation would have been unfinished. God rested on the seventh day because he was done. There is a rest for us to enter. And it is mandatory that we persevere unto the end. This is where the rest is found, at the end. We are not earning our own salvation by any means. But we are living out a Bible truth. What will keep us from reaching the end is unbelief. (coughs) Excuse me. What will keep us from reaching the end is unbelief. Now sometimes, most of the time, much of the time, if not all the time, that unbelief is described in terms of events and circumstances. Didn't like the way this happened, didn't like this, felt disappointed here, got gypped here, got abused here, and therefore I'm done. But biblically, it is all the same. It is unbelief. And that brings us to the real thrust of the sermon. Those are important parts of it, but they all lead us to the main point of the sermon, and that is we need somebody who can bring us to the end because we certainly cannot bring ourselves to the end. (coughs) That somebody is Jesus Christ. And he is presented to us, not just as Jesus Christ God, not just as Jesus Christ Creator, not just as Jesus Christ Savior, but as Jesus Christ High Priest. It is in his ministry as our High Priest that he successfully brings his people to their rest. It is in that role. And this is the reason, folks that the pastor spends so much time talking about Melchizedek and the significance of Melchizedek. Now, the congregation, depending upon what verse you're looking at, had either grown lax or fearful, either one. And he was writing to encourage them that they needed to persevere, not in their own strength, but in the strength that was provided by their high priest. Once again, the pastor is orienting us around not simply Melchizedek the man, but Melchizedek the high priest and his order, the arrangement. I'm not going to have you turn to them. I am going to ask you in a minute to turn to a passage. But Hebrews 5, 6, as he saith, although in another place thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 5, 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 6, 20, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 7.11, we just read. (coughs) If perfection, therefore, were by the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek? Hebrews 7.17, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7.21, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, two questions <coughs> that should run to our minds. One of them clearly a Gentile question. The other one probably more of a Jewish question. <coughs> Both of them answered in the text. <coughs> Do I as a New Testament believer need a high priest? Do I as a New Testament Christian need a high priest? And the answer to that is absolutely positively, that's what we keep talking about. We need a high priest. The Jewish component of the question is this. Why do I need a high priest that's completely different? I already have a high priest. I have a whole system in place. It has existed for centuries. It is thousands of years old. Not only that, its origins are divine. God invented it, not us. Why do we need another high priest? What's wrong with the system that we have? So we have two questions. They're really legitimate questions, folks. Both of them we should give some consideration to. And we're going to take this up in another sermon in a couple of weeks. But folks, we do need to recognize that we all have a rather complex relationship with the law of Moses. But we should also recognize that we are not under the law of Moses. Not in any way, shape, or form. And that is what the pastor will be arguing 
primarily this morning. And interestingly enough, he's going to argue it from an Old Testament passage. The pastor agrees previously, we looked at this last week, three men, Melchizedek, Abraham, and Levi, to contrast the two systems, the order of Levi and the order of Melchizedek, to make this point that the order of Melchizedek is superior to the order of Levi. Which brings us to the passage that we have this morning. And I want to just try and draw back a little bit and see the big picture. So let me call your attention to two verses. The first is chapter 7, verse number 11. Right? What's the big picture, folks? What's going on in this section, particularly verses 11 through 22? Right? We dealt, we've dealt previously up to verse number 10. What's the big point of verses 11 through 22? Well, point number one is this. The Levitical system could not bring you to completion or perfection. Verse number 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need that there was another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. So there is a deficiency in the part of the Levitical system, namely this. It cannot bring you to perfection. Perfection is the goal. Let us go on to perfection. The law of Moses will not take you there. Second part of the big picture, verse number 22, by so much was Jesus made surety of a better testament. The Levitical covenant, the law of Moses, the Mosaic covenant could not bring a man to perfection. Jesus can. And he does it apart from the law. And he does it apart from from the law. Now the reality, folks, is that the pastor could just say that, right? I made two points this morning. I made them in about two minutes. And in theory, we ought to just all be able to go home, right? <clears throat> the Levitical system is defective. Jesus is not. Thank you very much. But of course, the pastor doesn't do that. He takes verses 12 through 21 to fill out what he means. And again, he does that on the basis of an Old Testament passage. We're going to come right back to Hebrews, but I'm going to ask you to do something. We just don't do this, folks, so indulge me this morning. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 110. <clears throat> Turn this morning to Psalm 110. And here's what I'm going to ask us to do. <clears throat> I'm going to ask us all to read it out loud together. Are you ready? Everybody there? Psalm 110, not the whole thing, just verse number 4. Psalm 110, 4. We're all going to read it together. Here we go. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Psalm 110, 4, going back to Hebrews 7. Psalm 110, verse number 4, is going to outline our passage for us this morning. So first of all, Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's verses 11 through 14. Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Verse number 11 raises the question or raises the issue. What is the problem with the Levitical system? It makes nobody perfect. But perfection is the goal. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. There's no secondary goal. There's only one goal. It's the same goal for every believer. It is where every believer will end up, folks. We will be made in the image exactly of Jesus Christ. Even though this is the system that gave us the law. So let's not, right, let's not misunderstand 
Because as I said, we have a very complicated relationship with the law. And we are supposed to love the law. And we're supposed to value the law properly. But let us understand what happened. God gave the people a system that could never save them. God gave the people a system that could never save them. That's okay. It was never designed to save them. It would only have failed, folks, if its goal was to save them and then it couldn't do it. But it was never the goal of the law to save them. Quite the opposite. But the law could not bring anybody to perfection. Now, we're eventually going to get there, but chapters 8 and 9 spend a lot of time talking about what the priests actually did. Just the the details of what their activities were. So let me just summarize it. Priests performed a necessary function that enabled other people to have permission to have access to God. So if you will indulge me, and this is just simply an illustration and nothing else. If God were back there in the baptistry, and this was an Old Testament system, and you wanted access to God, you needed me, the priest. You couldn't just go to God. You needed somebody who would do something that would make it possible for you to have permission to get to God. You needed somebody who would do something that would make it acceptable for you. Or to use biblical language, you needed a mediator. Now, folks, the very notion of a priest is not confined to Judaism in and of itself. Many religions have priests. People who are mediators between God and And everybody else. Under Moses, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 11, right? The mediator was Moses. For under it, middle of verse 11, the people received the law. And we have the whole giving of the law. And the law is the rough outline through which the people would interact with the priest. He told them what offerings to bring, they brought the offerings to the priest. The priest offered the offering to God, and God accepted the person's offering because of the ministry of the priest. That was the Old Testament system. But it's changed. Hebrews 7, 12. For the priesthood being changed, right? This is part of what we got to grasp, folks. Jesus didn't become a priest for the old system. We have a whole new priesthood. We have a whole new system. For the priesthood being changed, Hebrews 7, 12, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Remember what Jesus said? He's not a patch for the old wineskin. You don't put new wine in an old bottle. If you're going to have new wine, you need a new bottle. And if you're going to have a new covenant, you need a whole new system. And that's going to mean an end to the old system. Jesus is a priest after the order of of Melchizedek. The word change there is actually a word that means a trading of places or a transposition. A transposing. What this means, folks, and it's argued in further places and we will get to it, but we are not under the law. We are not under the law. Now there is one Great distinction. And again, we're going to take this up. I'm just mentioning these now. This is an introduction to the introduction of where we're going. But there is one great radical difference 
between the system of Levi and the system of Jesus, and that is the indwelling Holy Spirit. Old Testament believers did not have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And there's, folks, the, 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 the implications and the ramifications for that are colossal. We just need to talk about that separately. But then there are two visible dimensions in our practice that are designed to blow the trumpet loud and clear that we are not under the old system in any way. Number one is this. We no longer practice ritual circumcision of males. We baptize believers. We baptize believers. The baptism of believers, both male and female, is a component of the new covenant, not the old. And every time, folks, we put somebody in the baptistry and we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are additionally making a declaration of our allegiance to a whole new system and a whole new priest and not the old system. The second glaring distinction in practice is the removal of dietary restrictions. They're gone. They're gone. Now, folks, if you think about it, if you think about what it was to be a Jew, if you think about the way Paul talked about what it was to be a Jew, if you think about the way Peter talked about what it was to be a Jew, they always went back to two big things that made them Jew, circumcision and diet. Tell me about being a Jew, circumcision and diet. <clears throat> tell me about being a new covenant saint. All right, I'm going to tell you about being a new covenant saint. Not bound by circumcision, no dietary restrictions. New Testament saint. Now, again, some people go, okay, wait a minute, I got to sit down because I, I think that you're wrong. But I'm just telling you, folks, that the New Testament has made it abundantly clear, painfully clear to the men who are on the receiving end of it, that the dietary restrictions have gone away. And read Acts chapter 15, right? Here come the Jews. And they go, look, if you want to believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. We're happy to have you believe in Jesus, but get circumcised too. And Paul and Barnabas said, hey, no, -uh. no, 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 we're not going there. And they had a whole big meeting and they got all the Jewish church leaders together. And they said, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, you can't make people get circumcised because we're under a whole new system, a whole new system. And in fact, folks, to go back to Hebrews chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14, right, because the pastor is making this argument. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he starts with the last part of it. That's the way he unpacked it. Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Notice this about Jesus' priesthood. Verse number 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change of the law also. Because, verse 13, he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. How different is the priesthood of Christ from the priesthood of Aaron? He's not even from the same tribe. He's not even from the same tribe. They're not, even, they're not even kissing cousins when it comes to this area. And in fact, folks, in Genesis 49.8, as Jacob is making his divine proclamation about the future of his sons, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until, I'm just going to translate it, he whose right it is comes. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. For all that the law said about, that Moses said about the law, for all the two tablets and the Ten Commandments cut in them, 
for all the applications and the permutations, for all the conversations that they had about the right way to do. They never had a conversation about this. What will be the tribe of the priesthood? It will always be and only be Judah, Levi. I mean Levi, not Judah. A complete outsider. Again, folks, what does Jesus say? You don't put new wine in an old wineskin. You don't put new wine in an old wineskin. So we don't need, we have a different priest and a different system. Why is that Psalm number seven, or Hebrews number seven, verse number 11, the law cannot make anybody perfect. It just can't. It just cannot do it. And so Jesus' priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. Secondly, again, Psalm 110 and verse number 4, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek and he is, verses 15 through 18, that priest eternally, eternally. Verse number 15, it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest. Now, I would argue that Hebrews 7.15 is the pastor's interpretation that Melchizedek is a mere man, a great man, but he's, he's, he's not an Old Testament appearing of Christ. There's a similitude there. He lived a certain way to lend credence to Christ, to illustrate Christ, but he's not Christ himself. Well, what is this similarity? Verse number 15. After the similitude of Melchizedek. What is, what is the sim similarity between Jesus and Melchizedek? Well, it is this. Verse number 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. <coughs> For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, <coughs> for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. All right. <coughs> So in what ways is the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of Melchizedek the same? They are like this. Number one, Melchizedek's priesthood was not based upon a commandment. What their Bible calls a carnal commandment, which doesn't mean a sinful. Oftentimes when we read the word carnal, we think sinful. But it just means this, fleshly. Right? It was an instruction given to the flesh. Look, folks, right? we understand this. Let's, let's put these pieces together. If we were Old Testament people, if we were Jewish people, if we could literally lay eyes on Moses, we would know that every priest came from the tribe of Levi. In other words, if you were a Levite, let's just say, let's just say you were a young man from the tribe of Levi. Nobody is ever going to say to you, son, what do you want to do when you grow up? Because there's only one thing you're going to do when you grow up. You're going to be a Levite. And the only question is going to be, depending upon how far back in your family tree you go, whether you're going to carry the furniture for the tabernacle, whether you're going to assemble the tabernacle, or maybe if you're not only from the tribe of Levi, but a descendant of Aaron, you're going to be an actual priest as opposed to being a Levite. On the other hand, supposing that you're from the tribe of Benjamin, Son, what do you think you'd like to do when you grow up? Well, I'd really like to be a Levite. Can't be a Levite, son. Only people who can be Levites are people who are Levites by flesh. That's the command. That's the command. The Levites weren't chosen from the most zealous among the congregation. They weren't chosen from the most gifted among the congregation. Moses didn't send out delegates, go to all the 12 tribes, find out who the, who the most godly young men are, let's make them priests. No, if you were a Levite, you were in, and if you weren't a Levite, you were out, period. 
But that's not true of Melchizedek. That's not true of Melchizedek. <clears throat> if we go back to, Gen to Hebrews chapter, we'll look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 3. Right? It's probably just across the page for you. Here's the characteristic of Melchizedek by divine design. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth to priests continually. In a book of genealogies, he has no genealogy. In a book of genealogies where almost everybody who has a genealogy has a record of their death, we don't know when he died. He just appears to be there forever. That's the similitude. Melchizedek is this kind of timeless figure in a world where everybody is measured by time. But there's more to go back to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 15. There's a similitude of Melchizedek who was made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. The Levites were Levites because they were Levites, if I can put it that way without being stupid about it. They were born to the tribe that God picked. That's it. Gentlemen, if you were a Levite, that's what you would be. Now, you may be an unfaithful Levite, but you would be a Levite. That's what you would be. End of discussion. But that's not why Jesus is a priest. He's a priest because, according to Hebrews 7.15, he has the power of an endless life. But wait a minute. Didn't he die? Does he really have an endless life? He died. Well, the word endless actually refers to its, its, to its indestructibility. Or as Peter preached in Acts 2.24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. You could kill him, but he wouldn't stay dead. He just wouldn't stay dead. So what God has done, folks, verses 17 and 18, God testified, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness thereof. Or as is said in Hebrews 7.11, if perfection were by the Levitical priesthood. But you see, it had that weakness and so the entire system, folks, this is what is being argued here. There is a disannulling of the commandment that went before, that came first. It was disannulled. It was put away. It was rejected. It was abolished. The only other place that word is used is in Hebrews 9 where it is applied to sin. It has been abolished, put away rejected but so here's what we have folks right here's here's we have a we have a priest because we need a priest with a whole new system and the old system was weak and ineffective it was entirely built around men entirely built around men sinful men men who themselves needed its ministry men who died men who sinned but they were there because that was the command. But they, but they couldn't bring anybody to the end of the race. It was, right? These look, folks, okay? Just Hebrews 7.18 uses harsh language about the law of Moses. For there is verily a disannulling and abolishment of the commandment that went before because it is weak and unprofitable. It was weak and useless. Weak and useless. 
And so it got abolished. It was, folks, symbolic, shadow, but never the substance. Never, ever the substance. But Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek who has an indestructible life. Levites are destroyed. They die. They sin. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. And so we have it again, Psalm 110, verse number 4. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Which brings us to the third point, the only remaining part of Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Jesus Christ is God's priest because God said so. Because God said so. Verse number 19, For the law made nothing perfect. Keep it faithfully. Keep it diligently. Keep it from the very depths of your heart. Observe its precepts meticulously. You're still short. You're still short. It is tainted with human death. It is tainted with human corruption in its practice. The problem is not the law. Paul has been very clear. The problem is not the law. The problem is on the part of those who are fulfilling it and living it. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. By the which we draw nigh unto God. Let me go back to my very primitive illustration. God is in the baptistry. And I am standing right here, folks. And this is not figurative. This is not imaginary language. This is truthful language. If you try to get to the baptistry without going through me, God is going to burn you like a crisp. I am the only thing keeping you from being consumed by God. And you have to keep your distance. And as you read through the law, folks, and as you read through the practice of the law, the people always kept their distance. What happened to Uzzah? Right? Good, godly, sweet-intentioned Uzzah. King David trying to bring back the Ark of the Covenant from the clutches of the godless Philistines. Put it on a wagon. Didn't read the rule book. You don't put the Ark in a wagon. The Levites carry it. And Uzzah reached out to touch it, just to hold it, just to keep it so it didn't fall. And he's dead right there. And our King James Bible said, because it's just hard to grasp it in the King James English, that God made a breach, or David made a breach. I mean, it was just, it was just like a shock wave that tore the whole fabric of that celebratory day in half. Why? Because you can't get too close. If you get too close, you're dead. All right? I'll stand here. I'll take your offering. If God accepts your offering, you're okay. But you still have to keep your distance. Don't get too close. And now, folks, we're close. We're close. This is the point. We're close. <clears throat> How close? Well, if we're really, truly New Covenant people, this close, folks, God's living in you. That close. That close. I mean, it's as close as it can get. That close. We're the temple. We're the, we're, we're the equivalent of the baptistry. God is there in the New Covenant. That didn't come about because of the faithful work of faithful priests. It came about because of the priesthood of the man who is from an outside tribe, who has his own command issued by God himself, I am swearing, I will not change my mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and the whole of the Jewish system is gone. The whole of the Jewish system is gone. 
So back to verse number 19, <clears throat> by the which we draw nigh to God. It's really an amazing thing, folks, to think about what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, that because of salvation by grace through faith, right, we just stand in the presence of God. We just have standing right there. And we go to the book of Revelation and we discover right there around the throne, right there in the presence of God, are his people. This is because of the work of Christ, not because of the work of Levi. Under the law, a believing man would be in a right standing with God, but he would never be close to God. So that even a man of David's prominence would pray, please don't take your spirit from me. Please don't take your spirit from me. Under the old system, verse number back to the, verse number 19, under the law, for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God, and inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. Right? He was made priest by a carnal commandment, a commandment of the flesh. All the children of Levi will be in the priestly system. But there was no oath made to them. There was no promise about the perpetuity of the system made to them. But there is a promise of perpetuity to the priesthood of Christ. You go back to Hebrews chapter 6 and you can read what the pastor said about God and his oath because he could swear by nothing greater. He swore by himself. And because he recognized that human beings crave that kind of commitment, he made one. He took an oath. And so verse number 22, by so much, by so much was Jesus made a certainty, a surety of a better testament, of a better covenant than the covenant of Moses. Ours is the far superior covenant. Ours is the far superior covenant. Paul, Paul pleaded with the Galatians, why would you go back to weak and beggarly elements? Why would you go back? Why would you give up a house with indoor plumbing and central air conditioning and electricity to live in a tent. Why would you go back? Why would you return? This is the question. Such superiority has come to us as new covenant people. Why would we go back? And this is what he's asking these people with their Jewish backgrounds. Why would you go back? Go back to what? We have the promise of a better testament and we really have a sweet exposition of Psalm 110, verse number 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Right? There's no one doing this. There's no changing this. You, Jesus, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And with the crucifixion, folks, and the resurrection, that old system just crumbled. It never had any power. It was always temporary in nature. It came along much later in the equation. It was only added as a temporary stopgap measure to demonstrate not the righteousness of men, but the sinfulness of men until the righteous one would come and inaugurate the new system. God never deceived the people about the nature and role of the law. He never, never said, what the Jews understood him to say. Paul said, well, why did the law come? It was added because of transgressions. What did Paul say to the Romans? Magnified sinfulness of men. We do need a priest. We have a priest. We have God's priest by his choice with an eternal priesthood, the certainty of a better covenant. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for this glorious, glorious New Testament truth that we have access to you. 
We have close proximity to you because of your priest, our Savior, who is both our priest and our King, Jesus Christ. Father, please help us to treasure this and help us to understand that it is only through the work of Christ that we have this access. I pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we stand, just uh, one announcement, I guess, this morning, and then we'll stand and have our closing song. Of course, 6 o'clock the evening service, 5 o'clock choir practice. And tonight is we're resuming our after-church potluck fellowship. So you're invited to stay for that as well uh, after the service, and we will see you this evening. Let's go ahead and stand. 387. First verse of 387, because he loves. tonight.